Good evening and welcome to our 6.30 Bible study here at Lee Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, we are so very glad that you have made the decision to join in with us for Bible study tonight. We never take for granted that you might have other options when it comes to your online Bible study experience, which is why we always want to make sure that we pause and say thank you for taking the time to tune in with us. Your presence online helps us to lift the name of God up as we go through the Bible and study more of his word, that each of us may grow in our spirit and allow ourselves to be better people to carry out what God has placed in our lives for us to do. Certainly want to pause at this moment uh, to make sure that we center ourselves and prepare ourselves for our Bible study tonight. So let us pause for a moment of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you, God, for the chance for us to to gather, Lord, virtually, uh, to hear your word. We pray, O oh God, that you would continue to bless us, continue, God, to rain down upon us your knowledge and opportunities, God, for us to learn more may be revealed to us uh, through your word tonight. Bless us, O oh God, and allow us again, God, to grow in our spiritual being, to allow us, Lord, to face the challenges of this world, but also, God, to be able to inspire others. Lord, this is our prayer in your Son, Jesus the Christ's name. Amen. All right, we're in the book of Ephesians, chapter number six, and we are in this new chapter. Uh, as we have been going through Ephesians, we have gotten through chapters one through five, and now we're on chapter number six, and it presents to us a wonderful opportunity for us to learn more about God's word. Just want to give a brief recap as we look at Ephesians chapter one through three. Understanding that in the first, I'm sorry, one through five, understanding that in the book of Ephesians, Paul is really emphasizing teaching the church how important the relationship with God is as it's based upon the fact that we are one in Christ Jesus, which means that uh, no matter what our age, what our gender, what our nationality is, we are all part of God's kingdom. We are all one. More than that, what Paul teaches us as he taught the Ephesian church is the fact that and reminds us that we were once in a different place. We were once, as Paul describes, dead. We were uh, dead in our transgressions, but then we were brought back to life through Jesus Christ. And so Paul emphasizes the importance for us to know that, that we may be uh, better able to maneuver through the processes of our life. Paul, again, as I said, emphasized this oneness in Christ and he emphasized the fact that uh, we should understand we have left the old life and are clinging to a new life. And so what we'll discover is this. As Paul is talking about leaving this old life and going to a new life, as he's talking about going into this newness, as he's talking about understanding and appreciating uh, moving from death to life, it's important for us to note that Paul gives us certain uh, precepts for living. He allows us to understand what should be important in our lives. And as we went over last week in chapter number five, Paul starts to form this basis for a Christian household as he lays out what wives should do, what husbands should do in their relationship. One thing I, I imparted with you last week, I think, was the fact that even if you're not in a married relationship, uh, what Paul also emphasizes are, again, these roles in our lives because we can still uh, be respectful of our parents. And that's what we're going to get into tonight. We look at one of the roles that Christians, I mean, that children should play uh, in these respective situations. And so Paul does a good job, again, laying for us out precepts for living and teaching us about, again, moving from our old life into our new life. One thing I want to note is that Paul really pushed in chapter 5, uh, this whole notion of watching how we talk to each other, right? As he says that we should remove from ourselves obscene, silly, and vulgar talk, but instead let there be thanksgiving, let there be singing of hymns, let there be new conversations. And so I would emphasize that again as we go to, into chapter number 6. All right, chapter number 6 of Ephesians, we're doing verses 1 through 12 tonight because these 24 verses have so much stuff in them. I didn't want us to miss anything out of this, and so I want to look at verses 1 through 12 tonight. Now let us pr pray 
uh, as we read, rather, let us read uh, verses 1 through 12, all right? From the New Revised Standard Version. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, in singleness of heart as you obey Christ, not only while being watched and in order to please them, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Render service with enthusiasm as to the Lord and not to men and women, knowing that whatever good we do, we will receive the same again from the Lord, whether we are slaves or free. And masters, do the same to them, stop threatening them, for you know that both of you have the same master in heaven, and with him there is no partiality. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual, spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his holy word. All right, so Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Paul giving us a good opportunity uh, to discover how we may add these precepts to our lives, how we may so order our lives in such a manner that we are doing what God has called us to do, that we're living uh, as one in Christ Jesus, all right? So we're going to jump straight into this first question. As I said, in chapter 5, Paul places emphasis on the role of uh, wives as it relates to their husbands and also for husbands as it relates to their wives. And so there may be some out there that say, listen, I'm not married. Uh, does that mean that I'm not uh, going to fit into this chapter or this book at all? No, there's a place for all of us in this next question where Paul emphasizes something we all can be doing. First question we have, according to Paul, how should children act toward their parents? According to Paul, how should children act toward toward their parents. So now, it uh, doesn't matter whether you're married or single, it uh, doesn't matter uh, what status you're in, we all are in the same category when it comes to being children of our parents. Now, of course, one may say, well, what if my parents are deceased? Well, if your parents are deceased, uh, we can also talk about how you should have, right, uh, began to obey them and how you should have treated them, how you should have respected them, and what that'll do is it'll condition you so that when you see persons in your neighborhood, persons in your church, person in your work who are of a similar um, position in relation to you, maybe your aunts or uncles or maybe a senior member of your church or senior member of your community, you may then apply that same measure of respect to them. So what does Paul say? Paul says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. Now, it's important to note that what Paul is trying to teach us and teach the folks in the church of Ephesus is that we should obey our parents. Now, we want to put this disclaimer out there. Now, certainly, if a child is in a household where parents aren't doing the right thing and are not following God's ordinances and are living an old unholy life, we're not saying obey them, right, and, and, and follow them down that path. What we are saying is if you can uh, identify that your parents are doing the right thing, if you can identify that your parents are living a righteous life, if your parents have put before you opportunities for you to also do the right thing, our response should be, that we live in a manner that is respectful and obedient to our parents. Now, watch this. Don't miss this part. 
Notice what Paul says, children obey your parents in the Lord. For those who say, well, what about my parents who have now been deceased? Take a moment and ask yourself, is the life you're living now still one that displays obedience to your parents? Let me back up here for a minute to say this. So what if my parents said, Harold, do not steal, do not take from others what is not yours? It doesn't make sense for me to wait until my parents are deceased and then say, well, my parents are no longer alive. I don't have to obey my parents' commandments. No, notice what the Bible says. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. I still have to obey my parents' ordinances. I still have to obey my parents' precepts for me. I still have to obey the things my parents said to me because in doing so, notice what Paul says, in doing so when you honor and your father and mother, this is the first commandment with a promise so that it may be well with you and you may live long in the earth. We need to be able to declare that even at 50, even at 60, even at 40, even at 30, even at 80, that we are honoring our parents by our lifestyle. We need to still be living like our parents would be proud of us in the things that we do. If we were to live that way, again, the Bible says, it will be well with us and we will live long on the earth. And so this is the promise that God gives to us. This is the precept that God gives to us, that if we honor our parents, if we obey our parents, whether they are living now or whether they have gone on to glory with God, we still need to obey their commandments. We still need to live in a manner as if we want them to be proud of us. We still need to obey our parents because the, the prayers of our parents is what got us to where we are. The, the character our parents put inside of us is what got us to where we are. The investment that our parents made into our lives is what got us to where we are. None of us are here because we did everything right all the time. Most of us are here because our parents invested time in us, oftentimes going without because they needed us to have, oftentimes sacrificing so that we could benefit, oftentimes staying up late, helping us with homework projects, oftentimes driving us or making sure we got transportation to, to the school and to rehearsals, the after school programs, oftentimes being there and cheering for us on the football and in basketball games or cheering for us as we went into gymnastic classes or cheering for us or, in the, or encouraging us to go to school or encouraging us to get a good job. Our parents made investments into our lives and because of that, God says, honor your parents in the Lord. Obey them that you may be prosperous and live long in the earth. And so I'm glad that we have the chance today to honor our parents and to live a long life. All right? Now, this is not the second question, but I want to touch on this for a minute. Uh, verse 5 is a verse that was often used uh, by slave masters in America and other places to justify that their actions were proper and approved by God uh, when it says, slaves obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling. This was a familiar passage that was preached by uh, Caucasian slave owners to their African persons who were stolen from Africa and made to be slaves to justify that the persons who are of African descent who were stolen from their homeland should obey their masters. But what wasn't considered was the fact that the kind of slavery that was talked about in the Bible was likened unto and similar to indentured servitude. When Joseph, the son of Jacob, was sold by his brothers to some other people and then he was given to Potiphar to be his slave, if you notice, that slavery was not one where he was chained up and where he was beaten and where he was almost starved to death or whether he was brought across a sea in the Middle Passage. No, this slavery was one where he lived in the house with Potiphar. He worked in the house and he had charge of the entire house. That's completely different than the chattel slavery in America 
where persons were stolen from their homeland, where persons were beaten almost to death, where persons had their limbs chopped off, where persons were separated by their, from their family, and where persons were raped. That's different, and so I just want to educate you right now and, and, and give you this information in case anybody ever says, well, the Bible talks about slavery. No, that's a different kind of slavery than what was going on in America and other parts of the country dealing with persons taken from Africa and spread across the globe. So just want to be clear about that because also what the slave masters did not do was read verse number nine where it says, and masters, do the same to them. Stop threatening them for you know that both of you have the same master in heaven and with him there's no partiality. So when it says do the same to them, do what same to them? Maybe verse number seven where it says, render service with enthusiasm as to the Lord and not to men and women, knowing that whatever good we do, we will receive the same again from the Lord, whether we are slaves or free. If the masters had read this, they may have seen that they were expected to also treat their slaves like they want to be treated. All right, so I just want to lift that point up uh, before we get into our second question tonight. All right, second question. According to Paul, what is needed to combat Satan? Verse 10, Paul says, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, it's important, we'll get into this further in, in our chapter when we talk about the various parts of the armor of God. But it's necessary for Paul to talk like this because we are in a battle. We are engaged in a battle every day of our lives. Every day that we wake up and, and start our day off, we are in a battle for our existence. We are in a battle for our souls. We are in a battle for our sanity. Satan desires to destroy us. The evidence of that can be found in the book of Job, one of the evidences rather, can be found in the book of Job where the Bible says one day uh, God was in heaven and Satan showed up and the Lord asked him, where have you been? And he said, I've been going to and fro all about the earth, seeking whom I may devour, looking for somebody whose life I can turn upside down, looking for somebody whose life I can destroy, looking for somebody whose faith I can deplete, looking for somebody who I can make stop believing in you. And God said, well, have you considered my servant Job? And the, the Satan said, yeah, but you got a hedge of protection around him, and I cannot get to him. So God allowed him, as he pulled a few hedges down, to come in. But Job was able to resist because he had on the whole armor of God. Job had on what was necessary to deal with the wiles of Satan. Job was dressed for battle. Many times we lose the battle against Satan because we are not dressed for the battle. We are not equipped for the battle. And we think that we have to be equipped in our own armor. When David went to battle Goliath, all the soldiers gave him something to go fight Goliath with. They gave him swords and they gave him armor. But David declared to them, I can't wear this armor. It's too big for me and I haven't trained in this armor. He said, I'm just going to go out here and what I have on. And what he had on was the whole armor of God. He had confidence in God's power. He had faith in God's protection. And he had confidence that Goliath would not be standing soon after David declared who is this uncircumcised Philistine when it comes to the power of Almighty God? And in that assurance, in that power, in that faith, in that armor, he was able to sling one rock and destroy this giant Goliath. In the same manner, we can wake up every morning and get dressed in the whole armor of God. If we don't wear the armor of God, we may find ourselves in the middle of the day unable to deal with the battle we're facing. If we leave out of our house without our helmet on and without our shield and without our sword and without ourselves girded up, we may find ourselves unable to deal with the challenges of that day because we weren't dressed for battle. None of us at dare would walk out the house for work uh, naked. So why do we walk out of our house naked spiritually? We got to dress for the battle. All right, to that end, Paul also tells us who our true enemy is. Look at verse 
Number 12, the question is, according to Paul, who is our true enemy? Verse 12 says, for our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual force of evil in the heavenly places. That's important to note because at any given day in any of our lives, we may be faced with a situation where we believe that our battle is with somebody who has done something to us. Now, let me be clear that when David was fighting the Philistines after he'd slain Goliath, he became king, and the Philistines came up one day and were trying to do battle with David. And David inquired of the Lord, shall I go and do battle with them? And God said, yes, go and engage in battle with them because I have given them into your hands and you will be successful. Well, a few times later, uh, the Philistines came up again to do battle with David. And David inquired of the Lord, shall I do battle with them? And he said, no, don't do battle with them. He said, just be still and, and, and watch my glory be revealed in front of you. He said, when you hear something in the treetops uh, rustling, those will be my angels. He said, when you see them go down and wipe out the Philistines, all you need to do afterwards is go in and clean up what I've already done because this battle is not yours. This battle is going to be mine. So what's that mean, Reverend Love? Well, sometimes God has for us to engage these battles, and sometimes he doesn't. But what Paul wants us to understand is whether we engage in the battle or not, our true enemy is not the physical person in front of us. Our true enemy are the heavenly and, and, and deceptive forces of Satan. Our true enemy uh, is not flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities, against cosmic powers and the present darkness. In other words, when somebody is doing you wrong, they're not your true enemy. Sometimes Satan sends somebody into your life to do something to you purposely to get you out of your character. Many times Satan will come into your life to do something to you to get you to jump out of character. Many times Satan will send some trouble into your life out of the blue, somebody you don't even know, to do something to you to get you to act out of who you are all so that he can expose you to more terror, all so he can expose you to more punishment so that somebody can say, I thought you were a Christian. I thought you were saved by God. I thought you were filled with God's Holy Spirit. Why are you acting this way? And it's difficult many times because folks will push your buttons. Folks will do things to you that will cause you to stop and say, why in the world is this happening to me? But I promise you, trust me, I've been through many things myself. And at the end of the day, when you step back from a situation and you evaluate it and you realize it's not them, but it's Satan moving through them. It's not them, but it's Satan trying to get me to respond to them. It's not them, but this is a, a heavenly battle that I'm engaged in. This is not flesh and blood, but these are cosmic powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. And so the only way we can do battle with spiritual wickedness is with spiritual righteousness. The only way that we can fight those cosmic powers is with our Heavenly Father. We cannot engage in battles with Satan with our fists and our words. We must fight with our spirit and our soul and our mind and our faith. And in doing so, we will always be victorious. Well, I hope this has blessed you and I hope it's given you some inspiration. Again, I promise you, it's not always easy, uh, but you must uh, rely upon your, your firm foundation, what you're anchored in, to make sure that you don't jump out of character or lose your religion or lose your mind and, and find yourself in an embarrassing situation because you allowed Satan to draw you out of who you are. Amen? Amen. Listen, I want to encourage you, and I want to uh, ask you to continue to do the right thing. And the Bible says, when you sow spiritually, you shall reap spiritually. And I invite you to understand that we are all given the opportunity to do the right thing and to live as God wants us to live. The opportunity is always going to be there. We have to look for it. And again, be like Job. Be steadfast. Be immovable. Be a solid foundation that God can count on as he wants to use you to help somebody else. He wants to use you to bless somebody else. Amen? Amen. All right. I want to uh, make sure that we 
do just a few things again. Be sure to please join us for our prayer call on tomorrow. Amen. We want to make sure that we have an opportunity to pray for somebody else as they are dealing with issues in their life. We also want to remind you that the celebration of life for Sister Margaret Groves will be this Saturday at 11 a.m. visitation, 12 noon service. At Lewis and Wright uh, Funeral Home on Friday from 3 to 5, there'll be visitation. So let me say that again. Visitation Friday is from 3 to 5 at Lewis and Wright Funeral Home on Clarksville Highway. The, the celebration of life is here on Saturday with visitation starting at 11 and the funeral service uh, following at 12 noon. So I want to encourage you to keep praying for the family, uh, keep praying for their strength, and keep praying for God to move in their life, that he may comfort them and, and give them ease. Amen? Also want to make sure that we keep praying for our members who have also uh, been bereaved these last few days and, and remind them uh, that comfort is coming in the morning. Amen? That even though there was, there was some weariness and some, and some tears, right, that joy indeed does come in the morning, all right? So again, keep that in mind. Stay safe out there. Uh, please keep masking up. Uh, keep making sure that you are socially distant when you can, and keep uh, washing your hands and keeping sanitizers on. We will all get through this together. We will be able to overcome all these challenges, and I guarantee you we will find ourselves in a better place because God will continue to bless us as we do these wonderful things to keep each other safe. All right? So we're going to get out of here. Uh, I pray that God bless you and he keep you, that he make his face to shine upon you, and that he give you peace, and that God bless you real good. Until next time, that is my prayer. <laughs>